playthings of fate. Every man has his own destiny. The only imperative is to follow it, accept it, no matter where it leads him. Henry Miller But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 3 There are two forces, fate and human effort. All men depend on and are bound by these. There is nothing else. The Mahabharata. Charles Cabot, son. Forgive me, but I have little choice in these matters. It has been decided. Do whatever you think is in your own best interest, but the fate is upon you, and you will not escape it. Matthew Cabot's letter to Charles Cabot, Tarnsman of Gore. The very first lesson the wisdom of Gore teaches us is that we are not in control of our lives. We are, all of us, the playthings of fate. In the novels about Gore, this is presented to the reader via different background events and tropes. The people of Gore may be born to a high social station, but luck or circumstance can bring them as low as slavery. Diseases can strike a healthy person, one's wealth or social standing can be destroyed, or one may find themselves slain in a duel they try to avoid. The world of Gore is filled with disasters that can strike a person out of the blue, undeservedly, and seemingly with no meaning. Fate is a very real force in Gore's fiction, because fate might indeed be a force in our real world. We small human beings are often forced to react to fate's whims, rather than command the course of our own lives. The first example of this is the selection of Tarl Cabot by the Council of High Case of Caroba to steal the homestone of R. Charles' father, Matthew Cabot, believes that the priest kings control the ships that abduct humans from Earth, and that Tarl has been chosen for some purpose that Matthew cannot know. When Tarl Cabot, hearing of the customs of Gore, and the limitations placed upon the Gorians by the priest kings, begins to object and ask why no one has rebelled, we are told that the priest kings possess a power to kill at a distance with an ability called the Flame Death. This almost sorcerous ability strikes without error, is always fatal, and serves as a deterrent to violation of the priest king's rules. The flame death is witnessed in public displays as the target is consumed by the blue fire. So assured of their supremacy are the priest kings that they do not care if earthmen know of their existence or that of the counter-earth and its three moons. Tarl tells us the reader, What could you do? You could do nothing, you with your rudimentary technology of which you are so proud. You could do nothing, at least for a thousand years, and by that time, if the priest kings choose, this planet will have found a new sun and a new people to populate its verdant surface. That fate can destroy our most treasured aspects of our identity is presented to the reader by the events that happen to the character of Tarl Cabot. The first chapter of Tarnsman of Gore presents us the reader with an idealized academic. Tarl is educated, physically fit, polite, and insufferably British. He is possessed, perhaps, of a slightly anachronistic character, as he is willing to deceive an American college in New Hampshire into believing that he has credentials he does not actually possess. But he also has a sense of obligation, as he attempts to remain ahead of the students of the subject that he is not qualified to teach by reading ahead of them and being sure that he understands the material. He hardly seems like he possesses the destiny of a hero. He has not the cunning of Odysseus, the strength of Hercules, or the invulnerability and potency of Achilles. Yet fate, in the form of the will of the priest kings and the council of high castes, abducts this mild-mannered academic from 20th century earth and removes him from the environment of its societal constraints against violence to plant him on a world that encourages barbarism. Once there, Tarl experiences a martial eudaimonia. Perhaps the priest kings have some instrument that allows them to predict the outcomes of their plots, but due to references in the Gore novels, about several of the castes being bred for their function, I feel we can infer that perhaps Tarl has inherited a genetic predisposition to martial ability and the barbaric mentality that Gorian culture fosters. This is certainly the intention of a scene in which Tarl is first introduced to the Tarn, a giant eagle-like animal, and we are told that Gorians believe the ability to master these birds is an inborn ability. Tarl is abducted by the priest king's strange ship to be taught swordsmanship and the culture of Gore. 
Charles Tudors are warriors, scribes, and his own father, who are perfectly suited to enculturate him to the barbaric world of gore. Though the novel, as a work of fiction, makes it easy for an author to play at being God, we the reader should acknowledge that the plot of the story seems to be one in which fate is the act of force. Nor does fate seem to care about the comfort of human beings, or even of its own agents. Tarl tells, <clears throat> excuse me, Tarl himself is made a slave during this first novel, and also in the second novel, Outlaw of Gore. Yet fate for Tarl does not seem to be entirely malign. Talana, the daughter of Marlena of Ar, the Ubar of the city of Ar, falls from her high station to be captured by Tarl. Then later she is captured by Pakar the assassin, then by Tarl again to become his slave. In his travels, Tarl meets a man stricken with a disease called Darkosis, an affliction not unlike leprosy, that is believed to be the wrath of the priest kings upon those that anger them. Tarl witnesses defeated warriors being drug away as slaves for galleys, and we are told that to be born a noble on Gore is a mixed blessing, for though it grants a Gorian more authority and privileges to be a noble, should one city fall into <clears throat> should one city fall in battle to a foe, all the nobles are likely to be impaled on spears. This threat is shown to us the reader when news reaches Tarl that Talana has this fate awaiting her when she is a captive of Pakar. Sorry, that may be Pakur. <clears throat> Yet on Gore, fate does seem to favor its chosen instruments. Tarl escapes from certain death on multiple occasions by what appears to him to be nothing more than chance. Tarl is spared from death when a crossbow bolt fired by Pakar the assassin, Gore's most preeminent assassin, fails to strike him. Pakar also spares Tarl from an instant execution when he captures the hero. The second time in Tarnsman of Gore that, Tar that Tarl cheats death is when he falls from a great height. Talana has pushed him with the intent of him being slain, and he is saved when he falls into the net of an intelligent spider. Tarl survives duels with warriors that are much more experienced than he. He fights in chaotic battles in which no stray arrow or spear thrust finds a path to wound him. When Pakar has Tarl crucified, the cross to which he is strapped is plucked from the jaws of hungry water lizards, an animal not unlike an alligator, and carried into the air by a wild tarn. This fantastic scene is supplanted by an even more fantastic intervention when Tarl's own tarn rescues him from, a, from the attacking tarn. Later, he survives a chamber filled with wild tarns that have gone hungry and are ravenous, and these are just the least of his deeds of daring in Tarnsman of Gore alone. We can assume that fate spares Tarl because he has a special mission, in this case dictated to us by the author, but when we look at the great persons of our own real world, they do all seem to share an extraordinary measure of luck. There is a scene in Tarnsman of Gore where Tarl attempts to deceive an entire military unit into believing his bluff so that he can rescue Barlinus. This attempt relies solely on a knowledge of the ethical codes by which the military men are supposed to obey. But in an earlier conversation with Torm the scribe, Tarl tells us that Gorians break case codes, such as a temporary war leader becoming a tyrant, is not only a not unheard of, but can be expected. Indeed, the man that Tarl is trying to attempt to rescue, Marlinus, has committed this very crime himself. Yet fate favors our hero and none question his fabrication too deeply. By the end of the novel, Tarl has slain the Asuper Pakar, rescued Marlinus, and accepted the submission of Talena. These, and his future accomplishments, are deeds the envy of Hercules himself. So what is it the wisdom of Gore is trying to tell us about how to deal with the force of fate? Is it best to pass through life accepting whatever happens as predestined and never attempt to change our societies or improve our psyche? Or do we pursue fate and demand it enter a boxing match with us, even though we may not win? The wisdom of Gore holds that fate, in the sense of the result of one's actions, cannot be foreseen nor can it be altered simply because men do not approve of the prescripted outcome. Yet the Gorian paradigm seems to askew any concept of what we might call karma. Men act, and their attentions have little to do with the result they produce. We can see this at the end of the first conversation Tarl has with Matthew, 
when Tarl, in regards to why the priest kings, has a stand-in for fate, do not fear mortal men discovering their abductions and plots. Let me return to the quote Tarl has that he gives to the reader. And what could you do? You could do nothing. You, with your rudimentary technology of which you are so proud, you could do nothing, at least for a thousand years. And by that time, if the priest kings choose, this planet will have found a new sun and a new people to populate its verdant surface. The many low-case people of Gore suffer from a strict control of the priest king's demands, the rule of initiates, and the wars fought by the warrior caste. What wrong did any of these low-case born commit to be so punished? Why, what notorious deed have the high caste done when it is they that are behind the plots and disasters that often earn the ire of the priest kings? Not a thing. Yet the Gorian wisdom is not entirely fatalistic or nihilistic, despite attempts by some fans of these novels to draw those analogies. I put before you that the Gorian wisdom is more alike to that of a real-world religion and culture, namely, that of Vedic Hinduism. Gold is tested by fire, a good man by his axe, heroes by perils, the prudent man by difficult circumstances, friends and enemies by needs, the Mahabharata. Though the wisdom of Gore does not accept the concept of karma, it forges dharma, that which one must do, into strap irons for the mind. We are shown this by the case system of Gore. The case codes Tarl tells us about, which constrict what a case member can do and dictate their function, and the attitudes and philosophy that Gorians are shown to generally possess, is much closer match to the Vedic ideal with a significant mixture of Stoicism. Seninka would recognize amongst the Gorians concepts familiar to his letters to Lascelles, and the ancient Lacedaemonians would recognize their spirit in the breast of the Gorian warrior. Like the warrior heroes of the Mahabharata, Charles is expected to fight and die, to attempt daring deeds and have little chance of success, and despite the inevitability of death, to live as present and vivaciously as possible. Against fate, the wisdom of Gore does not encourage a human to think of winning, but of doing their duty and performing as best they can. Warriors are expected to fight, scribes to record, priests to perform rites, and slaves to obey. What happens to them is not important, and ultimately all Gorians will share the same fate, that of the silence of death. Given that this is the end of all human life, it matters not to the Gorian how their lives end, but rather how they were lived. It matters not that they, what they accomplished, it matters what it is they attempted. We can see this last concept in the treatment of Marlenus the tyrant by the city of Ar. The super Pakar and the caste of initiates of Ar have conspired to slay Marlenus and his family as conditions to a peace deal with each other. When they are overthrown with the aid of Marlenus and his men, the men of Ar ostracize Marlenus. He is reported to go into exile, but still be so loved by his men that they will still refer to him only as the Ubar of Ubar the warlord of warlords. In our real world, this lesson can be quite the balm against the stress we encounter of trying to meet expectations. Stoics tell us that one cannot control the actions or perceptions of others, so it is best to simply act as one should, with no concern about the outcome. Those of you familiar with Kuido, the Zen-influenced art of archery, are well acquainted with the idea that one does not think of hitting the target with an arrow. One concentrates instead on doing each tiny part of the archer's ritual correctly in and of itself, and the arrow will fly to the target on its own. The wisdom of Gore does not expect nor encourage passivity, but instead consoles us not to be obsessed with the results of what it is we are trying to accomplish. We will either succeed, or we won't. But we have no chance to succeed if our aim, if we do not do as we must. I once heard this phrased as, you can do everything you can, to make a tree grow and it might not, but if you don't do what you're supposed to, the tree won't grow. If we can internalize this truth, we will not be unduly upset when we meet with setbacks or obstinate people. Think of how less your bird of stress might be if you could truly set aside the disappointments you suffer when a fellow employee is cross with you or a client is difficult. Think of the inner peace you would experience when if in the face of something dangerous, such as a car accident, you could act unimpeded by fear and the dread of what happens after the encounter is ended. 
This is an idea firmly rooted in Stoicism, such as one might read from Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. If you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it, and this you have the power to revoke at any moment. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. The wisdom of Gore begins with this lesson, but does not end here. Next we shall discuss how we can know what is the best action to take and how to tell right from wrong as is presented to us in the novels.